gentlemen, welcome to Guan Shiping Guan Videos One Thought Roundtable. Our topic today is Where is China? Specifically discussed in the context of global governance in the 21st century. So this is what we, the team at Guan Shiping Guan Video, have been working towards over the past two years. Uh, roughly about two years ago, there were only two of us. We started with a simple vision because. We ourselves wanted to understand how China thinks and works, and perhaps more importantly, how it came to be this way, and how that is going to change the future of this world. So we went on to produce short videos, and、um, about some 18 months later, from when we first released our first video, today we are standing here with a thousand audience in this venue, and hopefully millions more watching through CGTN New Media, SMGs, K News, and Bilibili.com, and of course through the post-production videos that we will make available everywhere. So I want to first thank our friends, our long-term friends, colleague, and our co-organizer of today's event, Guancha.cn, one of the most popular online new media news outlets in China. Thank you very much for your support, and of course, Fudan University China Institute. Thank you very much. What you've given us is invaluable. Your academic support. Thank you very much. So today we are going to talk about where is China. And first of all, we have Professor Zhang Weiwei and Professor Kishore Mabubani to talk about the Asia wisdom in the age of the 21st century of global governance. So thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Please join me in welcoming Professor Zhang Weiwei and Professor Kishore Mabubani. Sure、that you all came here for, so I shall leave the stage to our distinguished speakers. But before I leave the stage, just a quick note on what's going to happen today. So、um, each of our speakers will get roughly about 10 minutes for a presentation, and then after that, I know that the two of you have some questions for each other. And I know, despite how much you agree on the role of Asia. In the 21st century global governance, there are at least one or two areas in which you do disagree with each other. So it should be fun to hear where you actually disagree. And of course, after that, we will be hearing from you, our audience, and our special commentators on the topic at hand. So let's first begin with a presentation from Zhang Weiwei. Um, Professor Zhang Weiwei was served as Deng Xiaoping's senior interpreter in the 1980s, and he went on to become one of China's best-selling authors, having sold well over a million copies. And it's the topic that is interesting. He writes about the rise of China, and he is the most popular author on the topic of the rise of China among Chinese audience. So, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the director of China Institute, Zhang Weiwei. Thank you. So, good evening.、Uh, as I can recall, this time three years ago, Zakaria, the renowned CNN host, asked tough questions to me at the international conference. He said, "Professor Zhang, you always say China should not copy the Western political model. Yet, look at Asia. Virtually all the countries in Asia." Have adopted Western political system. Why not China? I said, actually, my answer is very simple, because China has performed 
better than all the other Asian countries combined over the past three decades, especially on the issues of the greatest concern to the Chinese people, such as fighting poverty, producing middle class, creating overall prosperity, and the list goes on. Indeed, you know, four decades ago, China was as poor as Malawi of Africa in terms of per capita GDP. Now, China is the largest economy in terms of purchasing power parity. China has produced the world's largest middle class. China is now the largest trading nation. Again, the list goes on. So, how to explain China's success? You have all kinds of explanations. For instance, cheap labor. But it's not the case. There are many countries which offer cheaper labor than China. Some say FDI, foreign direct investment. Again, many countries have attracted more foreign direct investment than China, especially in per capita terms. Some say the market economy. Again, most countries in the world practice market economy, but so many of them landed in financial disasters rather than financial whatever. Economic prosperity, and then of course the famous line: "No, China is authoritarian state." Again, by the Western definition, so many countries in the world are authoritarian, but they fail to create what we call miracles. Obviously, China had done something different. If I have to summarize how to explain China's success, two words: the China model. Yeah, then it will evolve. Certain complications, especially about the political system, about democracy. How to define democracy? In the West, it's very simple: multi-party system, one person, one vote, universal suffrage. Yet Chinese would say this is at best procedural democracy, not substantial democracy. Then Chinese will say we have people's democracy, consultative democracy. We have Decision-making process,、uh, whatever, democratic centralism. The West will say, "No, this is not democracy." So we disagree on this very subject. But for the sake of our discussion today, let me borrow the famous phrase from Abraham Lincoln, the greatest American president by many: "Government of the people, by the people, for the people." Let's, for the moment. Use this as a working definition for the sake of discussion. Then we compare, you know, item by item, for the people, of people, by people. Say, the Chinese side or the Western side or the United States has done better. So let's look at first this for the people. And、um, I have found some interesting statistics. The first is, of course, the one I use very often: net household assets at median level. If you look at this United States figure, it's declining all the time. And by the year 2010, China's gap with United States was already very close, $10,000. And this $77,300 at the median level in China's developed region, which has a population of the United States, 300 million. It's closer to poverty line, so this enormous change of China's fate, especially vis-à-vis the fate of the United States, and they can look at another figure. To what degree you feel that your country is on the right track? If we look at this study by Ipsos, which is one of the largest opinion survey companies, in the case of China. 90% think the country is in the right track. In the case of the United States, 37%. In the case of France, 12%.、Yeah. Then, of course, for the young generation, do you feel that you can live better than your parents? Again, for the Chinese, 82%. Yes. For the Americans, 33%. For France, for the French, I'm sorry, 9%. Yeah, we cannot help it. You know. So, in other words, at least we can see apparently, with regard to for the people, the China model has done better. Now, concerning of the people, 
if you look at the composition of China's public civil servants, 93% of Chinese civil servants come from ordinary families, ordinary backgrounds. Compared with the United States, let me quote from Stiglitz.、Huh? United States now of the one percent by one percent for the one percent. Yeah, actually, it's not far from the truth.、Yeah. Now, the most controversial issue is actually by the people. How to rule the country by the people? For the West, the solution is very simple.、Uh, as I mentioned just now. One person, one vote, universal suffrage, multi-party system. That became、uh, synonym with rule by the people. Of course, now we know wherever you go in the West, this problem of what we called or they called, you know, elect and regret. You look at the approval rating for the U.S. Congress; it's less than 15 percent. Could you call this a democracy or rule by the people? It's a joke. No. So, if the West focuses on Procedures. The Chinese focus on more, on substance, or the substance of substance of democracy, which, to my mind, is good governance. In other words, we can even extrapolate from this. We should really usher in a paradigm shift from the so-called democracy versus autocracy to good governance versus bad governance. That will be able to explain much better. The existing world today and the world in the future. Under this kind of guidance, China has conducted gigantic and extensive experiments. For instance, in the political domain, we have tried what I call selection plus election. As I said on many occasions, you know, for top leadership, be a member of this top leadership. Usually, you are required to work at least twice. As the number one of province, which literally means you have governed you know, over 100 million people before you could come to this top leadership level. So this is obviously a better system. Selection plus election is better than simply relying on election. You can look at this issue of what I call the decision-making process. China practices what you may call new democratic centralism. The example. Is five-year plan. For every five years, we produce a five-year plan.、Uh, in many ways, the success of China is resolved this five-year planning. But this is a great innovation from the Soviet five-year plan. It involves actually hundreds, if not thousands, of rounds of discussions, consultations at all levels, from bottom up, from up down. You know, so this is a, an amazing process which leads to better. Quality of decision making. I remember one friend of mine who is from the United States, and he said,、uh, "Xi Jinping embraces the year 2050, while Donald Trump embraces the year 1950." Yeah, we can plan for next decades, plan for next generation, and this proved to be extremely good for the really fate of China. And behind this, I always argue China's civilizational state, which means China is a country, a result of hundreds of states amalgamated into one of its long history. And this also means, for so many thousands of years, China had been ruled under a kind of one-party system. You may call this, yeah, unified ruling entity. In many ways, the Communist Party of China has continued this tradition. And has it further extended and developed? So that explains a lot why the CCP is a unique institution in China. I want to really to summarize the China model in brief. In the political domain, as I mentioned just now, it's selection plus election. It's obviously better than simply rely on election. In the economic domain, it's a mixed economy: the state and the market, the state sector. And private sector, their roles are, on the whole, more or less well mixed. This is better than neoliberalism, Washington consensus. In the social domain, it is about positive interactions between the state and society, which allows Chinese society to be, on the one hand, extremely dynamic, creative; on the other hand, coherent. So this is crucial. 
Now I will discuss briefly with you China today and China tomorrow. And I think China is now the largest economy in the world in terms of purchasing power parity. If in nominal U.S. dollar terms, I think China will become the largest economy in five to ten years. China's middle class, from my own estimate, will be twice larger than the U.S. population. The U.S. population is roughly 300 million. Ten years from now, China will have a middle class, perhaps over 600 million people. China has already practiced. Medical insurance for all, and pension for all. Although there are levels of differences from region to region, yet I think arguably China has already done better than the United States. China also developed the world's largest home ownership system, much larger than all Western countries, which is important. China is also now the leader in the world. In the renewable energies, wind energy, solar energy, electric cars, etc. So, what will be the implications of all this on global governance, which is our main topic today? I think first, the China model will inspire more and more countries to explore their own model of development and modernization. Second. The international order will shift. It's already shifting from a vertical order, in which the West is above the rest in terms of power, wealth, and ideas, to a more horizontal order, in which the West and the rest are more or less on a par, on equal footing with each other in terms of power. Wealth and ideas, and certainly, as I mentioned earlier, there will be a shift of paradigm, which means from the so-called democracy versus autocracy to good governance versus bad governance. And in summary, you know, I want to make a point. I said, you know,、uh, China has learned so much from the West. China is still learning from the West. Child will continue to do so for its own benefit. I think now it's high time for the West to learn a bit more about the China model, the Chinese approach, and the Chinese ideas, or even learn a bit from the China model, Chinese approach, and Chinese ideas. It's not about you know we win you lose or you win we lose. Is about how to really enrich our collective human wisdom in tackling all kinds of challenges facing humanity today. It's in the interest of mankind, in the interest of what we call to building a shared future for mankind, for greater peace and for greater prosperity. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations, brother. 谢谢张老师 ，Thank you. And let's now give the spotlight to Professor Kishore Mabubani.、Uh, Mr. Mabubani served as Singapore's ambassador to the UN, and he was the founding dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. And his book, Beyond the Age of Innocence, was championed by Samuel Huntington as a must-read for all Americans. And the topic was, it was an inquiry into the power of America on the world.、Um, so, ladies and gentlemen, Kishore Mabubani. Thank you. I, I am truly happy to be here. I've always dreamed of performing in a beautiful concert hall like this. But don't worry, I'm not going to sing. If I sing, you'll all leave the room. <laughs> Instead, what I'll do is talk about the state of our world and Asia's role. Uh, in it. So let me begin by asking, what is the state of our world? And here I want to quote from a very famous saying by a famous、uh, British novelist Charles Dickens, who said once, 
We live in the best of times. We live in the worst of times. And this is probably a very good description of our world today. So how do we live in the best of times? Amazingly, when future historians look at our times, especially at the last 20 or 30 years, they would say that we have actually carried humanity to the verge of utopia. Now, this is a very strong statement to make. So let me back it up with evidence. Three examples. First, you'll be surprised to learn that we are living in one of the most peaceful moments of world history. The Harvard professor Steven Pinker has documented that battle deaths in interstate wars has gone down from 65,000 in the 1950s to 2,000 today. See the shrinkage. Second, we have reduced dramatically the number of people living in extreme poverty. Professor Max Rosa, Oxford University, has documented that in 1950, 75%, three quarters of the world's population were living in extreme poverty. Today, less than 10%. This is the most spectacular improvement in the human condition ever in human history. And third, the global middle class populations, and you see that in Shanghai, middle class populations, is exploding. In, it was 1.8 billion in 2009. It rose to 3.2 billion by the end of 2016. And in two years' time, about half the world's population is going to enjoy middle class living standards. And of course, as Weiwei said, China will have the world's largest middle-class population. So a round of applause for the largest middle-class population in China. <laughs> now, having given you the good news, how can I say we live in the worst of times? How? How do we live in the worst of times? We live in the worst of times because what has been until now the most successful civilization, the Western civilization, has now become the most pessimistic civilization. I think, Wei Wei, you showed some statistics on how the young people yeah. feel about the future. And trust me, they don't believe that a great future lies ahead for, the, uh, for them. And that's why they're voting for populist parties, rejecting mainstream parties, and they're fighting among themselves. You saw in the G7 meeting in Quebec just a few weeks ago, the G7 is broken apart. And so the question is, what's happened? That's why in April I launched this book in London called Has the West lost it. And I try to explain in a very short book what mistakes the West has made. It's made many. But let me highlight one. And this was at one of the most triumphalist moments in the history of the West, which was the end of the Cold War around 1990. Because having defeated the Soviet Union, without firing one shot, the West became so incredibly arrogant. And leading Western intellectuals in America and Europe enthusiastically embraced the famous essay by Francis Fukuyama entitled The End of History. And in this essay, Fukuyama said, and I'm quoting, what we may be witnessing is not just the end of the Cold War or the passing away of a particular period of post-war history, but the end of history as such. That is, the end point of mankind's ideological evolution and the universalization 
of Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. That's Francis Fukuyama. And as I say in my book, somewhat cruelly, his essay did a lot of brain damage to the West because his essay put the West to sleep at precisely the moment when China and India were waking up. As we know, China's economy took off in the 1980s after Mr. Deng Xiaoping, friend of Zhang Weiwei, <laughs> <laughs> launched the four modernizations in 1978. And India took off about a decade later after Manmohan Singh launched the reforms in 1991. And we have seen, Weiwei has documented this, what a spectacular rise China has had. And I can tell you that the same may well happen for India. And if you want to get a sense of what India's potential is, I suggest you look at the most competitive human laboratory in the world, which is the United States of America. It imports the best brains from every country in the world to come and live and work in America. So that's where you get the most ferocious competition. And guess which ethnic group has the highest income in American society? It's the ethnic Indian community. And how many of you know that two of the largest corporations in the world, Microsoft and Google, are run by ethnic Indians? So if the Indian population in India can achieve just one-third of the per capita income of Indians in America, India is going to have the largest economy in the world. So that's the potential that we have. And why is this waking up of China and India so significant? It's significant because from the year one to the year 1820, for 1800 out of the last 2,000 years, let me stress this, for 1800 out of the two, last 2,000 years, the two largest economies have always been those of China and India. And it's only in the last 200 years that Europe took off and America took off. So if you view the past 200 years of world history against the backdrop of the past 2,000 years of world history, the past 200 years of world history have been a major historical aberration. All aberrations come to a natural end, so it's perfectly natural to see the return of China and India. And even today, as Weiwei has said, in purchasing power parity terms, the four largest economies in the world are number one, China, number two, United States of America, number three, India, number four, Japan. So three out of the top four economies are already Asian. So the world has changed dramatically. But for us now, Western pessimism poses a great threat to the world because with this kind of pessimism, it makes it impossible for Western leaders to explain to their populations, just as we Asians, we had to adjust and adapt and change to succeed. Today, the West has to adjust and adapt and change, and no leader will tell them that. So that's dangerous for us. So in that, in that scenario, we have to do what we can to make sure that we have a good future for ourselves. So let me conclude by making three suggestions on what we can do to make the, continue, continue to make the future bright for Asia. First, let us build on the positive things we have done in this region, which is the regional multilateral processes. And here I'm going to give you a big secret. One of the reasons why Southeast Asia and East Asia has been at peace has been because of the association of Southeast Asian nations, ASEAN. And ASEAN has actually delivered peace and prosperity. And in a book that I co-authored with Jeffrey Singh last year called The ASEAN Miracle, 
I point out that the reason why we've been so peaceful is because ASEAN has provided the venue for all great powers in the Asian countries to come together every year. ASEAN has also delivered prosperity by signing free trade agreements with China, Japan, India and South Korea. And this year, we should try to complete the negotiations for the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, RCEP. The second thing we can do is to strongly support the Belt and Road Initiative that China has launched, because it is going to bring the region together. And here I want to mention, since I come from Singapore, that Singapore has been an enthusiastic supporter of BRI. And just to give you the data, China's investments in Singapore amount to one-third of its total investments in Belt and Road countries, and Singapore's investments in China account for 85% incoming Belt and Road investments into China. And we believe that more Asian countries should join Singapore in participating in the BRI so that we ensure that the Belt and Road Initiative is seen to be owned not just by China, but by many and other Asian countries also. And finally, we should also acknowledge that even though we have done very well, we haven't achieved nirvana yet. There are problems in our region. We're making progress. It's the good news that Donald Trump met Kim Jong-un in Singapore two weeks ago. It's good news that President Xi Jinping met Prime Minister Modi in Wuhan a few weeks ago. But we can do more. And here, I want to say that we can probably learn a lesson from Europe in this area of peace and security. And what's the lesson? The lesson is this. We have had zero wars in Asia for 30 years. We've also had zero wars in Europe for several decades. But the difference between Europe and Asia is that in Europe, you also have zero prospect of war. UK and France will never fight each other. Germany and UK will never fight each other again. Wars, zero prospect. In Asia, we have not yet achieved zero prospect of war. Let us make that our dream and let us achieve it in your lifetime. Thank you. So, Joe, thank you for your very brilliant speech. And uh, as our host, Xiao Li, suggests, you know, it's a difficult job. You know. As we all know, both of us share so many views on so many issues. Yet, Xiaoli insists we should find our differences. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's fight. <laughs> so, <laughs> to make discussion more interesting, yeah. engaging. So, now I've got one interesting question for you. And you mentioned correctly the ethnic Indian, Indian Americans, who are extremely successful in the United States. Yet, if we look at the country of India itself. Mm. I was there three times. And I feel that how to really allow this potential of the Indian people to be channeled into modernization and successful nation building. It's a really a daunting challenge. From my Chinese point of view, a certain stage of social reforms or even revolutions may be called for, except for my Chinese bias, such as women's liberation, land reform. Of course, at constitution level, India has abolished the caste system, mm. yet still mm. uh, permeating the society. Mm. So how to overcome this kind of uh, mm. uh, social conditions mm. so that the potential of Indian people can be really mobilized mm. and to build a successful yeah. nation? You're absolutely right. Mm -hmm. China is ahead of India in many areas. Uh, anyway, China's GNP, I don't know if you know mm -hmm. this, is five or six times five the size times of India's yeah. GNP. 
is much bigger. You've had land reform, mm -hmm. you've had a tremendous amount of social reforms. And India will have to catch up with China. But let me explain the why India, I think, is going to make it. Because I want to tell you, by the way, that India is a very, very different society from China. I'll give you one example. They say that China succeeds because of its government. And you documented this. India succeeds despite its government. <laughs> very different. <laughs> But it succeeds. <laughs> India is chaos. Uh, and on a daily basis, uh, you have chaos. And I'll tell you one story. At the height of the financial crisis, I was in India giving a speech to the Pan IIT Congress. And that's a very significant Congress. The Indian Institutes of Technology, by the way, are the one institution that have delivered more American CEOs than any other institution, Indian Institute of Technology. All the top CEOs in America come from Indian Institute of Technology. So I was at the Congress speaking to this group at the height of the financial crisis. And I was sitting with a group of Indian businessmen at lunch and I said, aren't you worried? Big financial crisis, countries collapsing. And they didn't look worried. So I said, come on, aren't you guys worried? So one guy got fed up with me. He said, come on, Kishore. What's going to happen if this, things get worse? I said, there'll be chaos. He replied, in India, we have chaos every day. <laughs> so it's a very different uh, environment. But I can tell you that capital, you know, I'm a student of Karl Marx. I spent a year studying Marx in Canada. Karl Marx actually documented brilliantly how capitalism really created incredible social changes. And in Europe, feudalism was destroyed by capitalism, mm -hmm. right? It was the Industrial Revolution that put capital in the capitalists and the feudal class lost mm -hmm. power. The same thing is happening in India too. And you can see, there was a, a, a fantastic uh, page one uh, New York Times story, which I cited in my, one of my books, about how the, the untouchables, as you mentioned, yeah. the lowest class in, in India, right, who were sort of, in a sense, had no hope, suddenly, by participating in, in capitalism and in markets, growing themselves, developing themselves, the class distinctions mm -hmm. uh, began to go. So in that sense, I would say Karl Marx provides part of the answer. And I can tell you one new thing that is happening in India, which is quite remarkable. India is not as far ahead as China, for example, on mobile payments. But the mobile phones are spreading in India, and the mobile phones are empowering mm -hmm. poor Indians and giving them access to information, knowledge, connectivity that they never had before. So all these positive trends will lead to the, the development of uh, India. But I think, just, just I want to come back to you, since we were supposed to have a dialogue. <laughs> Let me ask you a question now about a different subject, which is about leadership. Mm. The one thing that Zhang Weiwei and I share in common is that he has worked closely with one great leader, Deng Xiaoping. I have worked closely with another leader, almost as great as Mr. Deng Xiaoping, <laughs> Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, for many years. And I've always been asking myself, what is it? What are the key qualities that produce great uh. leaders? And I ask that question because, as you know, the world is somewhat short mm -hmm. of great leaders today. I don't <laughs> think Donald Trump is a great leader. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's easy, it's easy to pick on him, but he's not, obviously not, not a yeah. great leader, not one who inspires you, not one who, in a sense, you feel cares for your destiny and so on and so forth. So, if you, since you work very closely with Mr. Deng Xiaoping and you've yeah. tried to, in a sense, understand what makes great leaders tick, what would you identify yeah. as the key qualities of great leader? Uh, to my mind, perhaps, uh, even in the case of Deng Xiaoping and Li Guangyu, uh, something similar happens. That is, both of them have a long-term vision for their countries, and both of them have enormous, what I call the down-to-earth spirit. Mm. So they are, Deng's famous slogan is seeking truth from facts, not from dogmas. Mm. That's crucial. 
uh, in retrospect, if you look at what China has gone through over the past decades, essentially, I think in the world today or over the past four decades, two traps. One was I call democracy fundamentalism. Deng Xiaoping rejected categorically. The other is、uh, market fundamentalism.、Mm. Deng Xiaoping also rejected categorically. I think Li Guangyao actually has done more or less the same. So both Singapore and China have developed,、mm. and、uh, I think this is crucial long-term vision. And really, when many people think the Western model is the best model,、mm. then said no.、Mm. <laughs> when most people say market only solution, and then said the state should also play a role.、Mm. Yeah. yeah, as you know,、uh, Mr. Li Kuan Yew was a great admirer. Of Mr. Deng Xiaoping,、yeah. and、uh, Mr. Deng Xiaoping came to Singapore, I think in 1978,、yeah. and they had a very good meeting. And subsequently, as you know, even the Deputy Prime Minister、yeah. of Singapore was greatly honoured when he was chosen、yeah. to be one of the economic advisers to Mr. Deng Xiaoping.、Yeah. So I, th- I would、Wu-Ting、agree、Ray. with you that、yeah. the long-term vision and what I call the c- the culture of pragmatism、yeah. is a great strength of these.、Yeah. Uh, and concerning leadership, I may have.、Uh, Another slight difference.、Mm. <laughs> we discuss it together. I was reading the other day the memoirs of your India's former Prime Minister Nehru. I have the feeling that you know when he encountered tough choices and difficulties,、mm. he first thought of his schoolmates, classmates, Cambridge, old school. Boy school or whatever old、yeah. uh, uh, club. That reminds me a constant comparison between China and India. I have many Indian friends. They always tell me English is India's advantage over China. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always say not necessary. My argument is this: you know, at the technical level, yes, I agree with English. You can. Communicate better with the rest of the world, with the、mm. West, with other countries. But at a strategic level, you know, I always say, you know, fortunately, Deng Xiaoping spent six years in France,、mm. but was not able to pick up the French language. <laughs> <laughs> so that allowed him to think in the Chinese way. Yeah. You know, when you have a, a language from another culture. And which is really the language of the India's political intellectual elites.、Mm. Are you worried about what sometimes we call this colonization of mind? <coughs>、mm. An example is when Deng Xiaoping went to Singapore. He was deeply impressed with the enormous progress Singapore has made. That was in 1978. Chiang was way behind, but even at that time, Deng said. We should do better than Singapore eventually. Same with the United States. We should learn from the United States, but don't always think. Eventually, we should do better than the United、mm. States. Behind this is he's from Chinese culture,、mm. and he knows very well this is a culture、mm. which was、mm. much more advanced than the West、mm. for so many hundreds and thousands of years.、Yeah. So this mentality is always there. We should do better,、yeah. and we can do better.、Yeah. But in the case of India, very often you are the exception. <laughs> <laughs> many, many Indian scholars, politicians are met.、Yeah. Really think, you know, they feel so happy、yeah. that they are accepted by the West.、Mm. Well, I got, I got some good news for you. <laughs> 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 India is changing. Good. And、uh, you're right.、Uh, mm-hmm. In fact, I've written about this in my、uh, one of my first books, "Can Nations Think?"、Mm-hmm. That long after the political decolonization of India happened in 1947,、mm-hmm. I think, but the mental colonization of India continued, as you said,、mm-hmm. and、uh, Indian elites kept looking at London、mm-hmm. to get answers for, for the future,、mm-hmm. and didn't look east. But I would say, in the last twenty, thirty years, the prime ministers have all been saying, "Look east, act east, 
and there has been a reorientation. And I would say what makes uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi, the current Prime Minister of uh, India, very, very unusual is that in the past, the, all the Indian Prime Ministers, would st when they went to speak at international forum, they would speak in English, as you said. Yeah. And they would dress and they would wear a jacket and tie, like you and me, mm. jacket yeah. and tie. Prime Minister Narendra Modi, and I heard him in Davos in January this year, never speaks in English. <laughs> he speaks in Hindi. Yeah. He says, I will speak my language. Mm. And you never see Prime Minister Modi wearing a jacket and tie. Mm. He's always wearing uh, an yeah. Indian outfit. So the, what you call the mental decolonization, which is a critical process, mm. is happening mm. also in India. But at the same time, I would say in defense of English, uh, mm. especially for young people, uh, <laughs> I would say that don't underestimate the usefulness of mm. English today. Because if you travel around the world, the one thing that you'll find when you arrive in Argentina or South Africa or Australia or Kazakhstan is that if you're looking for one common language to use, most of the time, most people would speak uh, mm. English. And as you know, when pilots fly across the sky, yeah. <laughs> the language that they use uh, when they get air traffic clearance is English, for example. So yeah. it is a very useful uh, language still to have. And I wouldn't discourage people from learning it but I completely agree with what you said about uh, Mr. Deng Xiaoping, that we must aim to match what the West has done and we must now try to do better. Mm -hmm. And in many areas, yeah. for example, if you look at the admissions uh, into the top universities in the world, uh, Harvard, the Yales, the Stanford's, the Princeton's, mm -hmm. you'll find that Asian, Asians, including Asian Americans and uh, non-American Asians, are very competitive yeah. and when there is no when there's no racial quota like in the, the California yeah. Institute of Technology Caltech 43% yeah. of the students are Asian yeah. so the Asians have demonstrated very well that today you put them in any situation mm -hmm. they can compete mm -hmm. and they can uh, do well but here if I'm gonna ask you now a yeah. question since the theme now is about, is in a sense, global governance mm. and leadership and so on and so forth. And as you know, with China becoming the number one economy in the world, there is now greater expectation that China should provide more sort of uh, political, economic leadership to the world. And I'll give you one example. is One of the saddest things that's happening in our world today mm -hmm. Uh, are the trade wars that President Donald Trump has launched. They're completely yeah. unnecessary. We don't need those trade wars, but they have started. So right now, we are in a very vulnerable situation where one of the most valuable global organizations, the World Trade Organization, is under threat. Mm -hmm. Because if America walks away from it, it could be endangered. Mm -hmm. So the question is, do you see China playing a bigger role today mm -hmm in trying to strengthen some of these institutions. They were gifts from the West, mm -hmm. they were started by the West, yeah. but with America walking away from yeah. it, can China step in and strengthen these institutions? Yeah, I share your view. You know, these institutions are very important for the international community, and China is one of the major guardians of these institutions. And China is in many ways an advocate of reforming of these institutions, not dismantling them. And uh, fortunately, you know, given the size of the Chinese economy, China now is the world's largest trading nation. I made a rough calculation, about 130 countries now have China as their largest trading partners. In other words, technically, if the United States under Donald Trump withdrew from globalization, China alone can bring along many countries, given the size of Chinese economy and the trading relations. This is positive. And also, I think, in terms of this global governance structure, as you know, the West represents the vested interests. You see so many resistance to reform initiatives in IMF, in World Bank. So the Chinese approach is, uh, let's have some new 
institutions. It's not exactly to dismantle your institutions, but let's start some new institutions in which we practice really more democracy, mm. more win-win, more uh, cooperation rather than competition, such mm. as the AIB, mm -hmm. etc. So this may be one way how China can impact mm. this world. I remember, you know, uh, British philosopher Bertrand Russell came to China in the early 1920s. At that time, Chinese intellectuals mm. were deeply disillusioned about their country, about their culture, Chinese culture, because China was defeated once again and again by the European powers. And Bertrand Russell counseled the Chinese intellectuals. He said, you have a wonderful first-class culture, culture of peace. Mm. Then he made another point, mm. and he said, one day when China has enough capability for self-defense, mm. but at that time China did not have this capability, mm. then China's culture of peace would be a tremendous asset mm. for mankind. Mm. This is what China is doing now. Yeah, I think, I think if Bertrand Russell were alive today, yeah. he'd be very, very pleased uh, with the progress that uh, China yeah. has made. And I completely agree with you yeah. that uh, China is doing the right thing in setting up the, uh, as you know, the BRICS bank, the yeah. AIIB and yeah. so on and so forth. But I think China should also go one step further yeah. because the head of IMF, Christine Lagarde, has actually said once that it's written in the constitution or charter of the IMF, whatever yeah. it is, that the headquarters of the IMF will always be in the capital of the largest economy mm. of the world. Mm. And, you know, in market terms, as you know, I, I looked at your chart, according to your chart, in market yeah. terms also, uh, China is going to become the largest economy in the world within 10, 15 years. So then Beijing will have to make way and allow the IMF to move from Washington DC to Beijing. But as you know, it will be a big shock uh, to the Americans when that happens. So my last question to you, how will you console your American friends when the IMF moves from Washington DC to Beijing? <laughs> <laughs> I actually think of one thing, you know, now you are a senior fellow at our institute. Yeah. We are deeply honored you fellow, very yeah. pleased. Yeah. And um, you have uh, so many books translated into Chinese. Yeah. Yet, a challenge for you, these books have not yet become bestsellers. Yeah. So, if we can give you an assignment, <laughs> your <laughs> next book, yeah. and the title of this next book would be the answer, my answer to your question. Yeah. That is, why the West cannot learn? <laughs> <laughs> it will become bestseller. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> thank you. So, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. You see, very interesting. Some little encouragement to explore into the areas where you might differ. Very interesting. Thank you very much for the most thought-provoking discussion. I'm sure you've left many questions for our audience. So I'd like to now firstly hear from two of my friends. Um, 各位接下来呢，我们就进入互动环节。首先，我想听一听我们的观察员是怎么说的。然后呢，我们稍后还安排了时间给我们的现场的观众给两位提问，但是因为时间有限。请想提问的观众现在就可以开始到一楼会场的右侧找观视频的老马。老马会安排稍后的提问环节的。谢谢大家，欢迎大家踊跃提问。张老师一直说哈，这个问题是越尖锐越好。So <笑> if I may, I'd like you to hear from two of my friends. Um, very highly respected scholars here in China. Firstly, Professor Ding Yifan. Ding Professor Ding Yifan, renowned specialist on global economy and international relations, and also one of the most popular um, speakers on Guan Video. So, Zhang Weiwei, you've got competition now. <laughs> and a uh, quick introduction also to Mao Keji. Mao Keji. He is an analyst with the National Reform and Development Commission and also one of the most widely followed specialists on India among Chinese audience, so that says something, and a prolific writer 
for his age, I must say. So <laughs> <laughs> let's now hear from our um, commentators first. I'd like to uh, hear from you first, Professor Ding. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, thank, uh, I should thank uh, both speakers for their elo eloquent speech. Socrates uh, quoted a lot of examples, saying that if you are sick, are you going to see a doctor? Or are you calling a mass to ask them what you have to do? So he said that if you are sick, if you are ill, you are going to see a doctor because doctor is expert to tell you what to do. Well, the, the mass population, even the minority, cannot assess you, you, your sickness. Well, in terms of public governance, Socrates thinks that the mass population can do nothing to a better governance. So I think that this is very important, especially in this period of time. Because when they said democracy could be a good form of governance, it's because our assumption is that people are rational. People will think independently. Well, today we are witnessing a period of so-called post-truth period. And we are witnessing some very sophisticated ways of voters' manipulation, especially with those kind of history about uh, the U.S. presidential election. So we should wonder whether the so-called uh, free election or universal suffrage would still be an ideal form for governance or an ideal form for selecting leaders. That becomes a big question mark. So uh, my question to, to Zhang Weiwei is, uh, how could you assess the future form of uh, leader selection? A few comments about Professor Mabubani's talking about, about the, the Eastern and Western world. Actually, he was very right in pointing out that if we don't look at world history uh, about the 200 years, but about more than one millennium, one, 1,000 years. Most of the time, China and India was the biggest civilization, biggest power. And uh, China and India had the most sophisticated technology and the science. The way the knowledge uh, transforming is from East to Western world, and most of the Western world have copied technology and science from Eastern world, and nowadays, when they became colonizer, they forgot this history. Thank you. How about we hear from Mao Keqi first, and then the two of you can respond together. Thank you. I'm actually overwhelmed by our, the level of uh, excitement from our audience. Please. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, thank you, Professor Zhang Weiwei and Professor Mubani. I think I'm a poor commentator, but I'm a good student here. <laughs> um, I'm, gonna ask, I'm not going to comment on that, but I'm going to ask some student questions. Yes. I, first of all, I have to conf confess that um, I'm a very uh, enthusiastic advocate for the collective rights of Asia because I practice this myself. I studied South Asia politics in the U.S. as a Chinese student. That's a very weird combination, but I did that. I just graduated from John Hopkins size. So, um, so one question struck me when I was a student, that is, why should we be so optimistic about the future of the Asia? If China and India rise at the same time, will the odds of the conflict increase or decrease? That's my question. Hmm. And uh, recently, I published one piece uh, of um, article on the Global Times, you know that, Global Times. And the Indian people keep watching that, and Chinese people also read that closely. I, in the article, I said that uh, China should, re should help India to uh, industrialize its economy because industrialization is the one of the most important element of the chi China's rise. If China can help India to do that, then both of them can benefit tremendously from the process. That's that's my that was my argument. But I got attacked by a lot of people, both Chinese and Indians. Chinese people at attacked me because they they argued. 
India is the only the other one billion size pop,、uh, economy in the world. If India get industrialized, where should China be? And let me guess: the Indian the attack from the Indian side is that why would we need Chinese help to industrialize in the、exactly. first place? There we、Because、go. China <laughs> tried to colonize us economically. Why should we let Chinese people help us? Well, There's no yeah. point. Yeah. So that's my question. Why you know will the odds of conflict? Actually, increased when there's a collective rise of Asia. Please、Great. go ahead. Yes. And for Professor Ding's question, I just make one brief comment. Actually, you know, I made this remark, bold forecast, in my famous debate with Professor Fukuyama seven years ago. I said,、uh, you know, the Western political system, as it is practiced today, multi-party system. Uh, one person, one vote, will be transitory in long human history. In human history, it may be a slow death. Indeed, because about 2,500 years ago, you know, it was practiced in ancient Greek so-called city-states or by Chinese and villages. You know, <laughs> then for over 2,000 years, democracy was equivalent to mob politics. Only after Western countries became industrialized, modernized, they began to have this one person, one vote. Now the crucial is, as you mentioned, this assumption that human beings are rational. This assumption is faulty. I said three genetic flaws. This very assumption of human beings being rational. This idea that rights are absolute. The idea that procedures are all that important. All these three fatal mistakes or genetic flaws will close the fate of Western political system, unless they conduct substantial, meaningful political reforms. Otherwise, it will go down and decline further. So the rest is for you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I actually share, and I'm glad you quoted Socrates,、eh? mm. because it makes it very clear that. The concerns great thinkers have had about democracy have been very long-standing, over 2,000 years old. And you're right. When you're sick, you want to go to a doctor, and you don't want to go to the masses. And these are the limitations of democracies. And and as Winston Churchill said, democracy is the worst form of government, except for the alternative. So I want to mention something very important because this has also been the experience in recent times. Which is that countries have also suffered very badly when they had bad dictators.、Mm-hmm. So Philippines suffered under President Marcos. Zaire or Congo suffered under President Mobutu. Pakistan suffered under President Zia ul Haq. The countries went backwards, you know, under these leaders. So having a dictator is also a problem. So finding the right balance and creating the kind of meritocracy. That China and Singapore have successfully done is not easy, and it's not an easy thing. But that, at least we know that, that that's a way forward that we should try to do. And I strongly support meritocratic forms of、uh, government. Now the questions on China and India are much more difficult to answer because I don't know how many of you know this, but the relationship between China and India is actually quite complicated. <laughs> the many, most Chinese are not aware. That there was a border war fought between China and India in 1962. Most Indians are aware of this, so there is a certain obsession in India about China, but you don't have the obsession in China over India. It's an asymmetrical、uh, relationship. But at the same time, the former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh has said the world is big enough for both China and India to grow. And I want to make just one point on China and India. The future of Asia will depend on one big question: Can China and India get along? Because are the, these are the two biggest societies: China, 1.4 billion; India, 1.3 billion. By 2050, India's population will be bigger. So, if the two most populous countries, China and India, don't get along, then Asia is in trouble. So it's very important that the young people of India and the young people of China make a huge effort 
to overcome the recent untroubled history and remember that before the period of Western colonial rule, when the Asian countries lived side by side, you had 2,000 years of peace between China and India. China and India never fought a war for 2,000 years. So that long history is far more important when you look ahead and we should not be bothered about what happened uh, in the last 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, shall we move on? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, I'm inviting our audience to uh, take the question. My greetings, your honourable gentlemen. And here is my question. Well, we do believe in, we all have, we have all reasons to believe in the Asians, but are we now enduring some kind of Asian optimism and how will it influence us, the Asian? And that's my question, thank you. Uh, yeah. Asian optimism, I think, is uh, right in the sense that we have reason to be optimistic because of the performance of China, India, and many other countries. And without this sense of optimism, you cannot overcome the future challenges. I always think the positive energy is crucial, is important mm. for the further success of Asian countries, for sure. Yeah. Uh, le let me just add, uh, by the way, uh, I'm a very old man. Uh, I'm going to be 70 years old this year. And when I grew up as a child, Singapore was a very poor country. Our per capita income was the same as Ghana in Africa. And when I grew up, uh, I was considered uh, undernourished. I was put on a special feeding program because I came from a poor family. Now I'm overnourished. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and I can tell you that if you live in poverty, you live in deep pessimism. And you feel that life is hopeless. You cannot improve your life. You can't do anything about it. So being liberated from poverty, being liberated from pessimism is the most spiritually uplifting thing that can happen to you. So we should welcome the optimism that Asians have and encourage more of it to come. And because the more of it comes, the better we will do. I'll take the next question, please. Hi, good evening to, uh, to gentlemen. And um, I got a question for Professor Zhang Weiwei. Um, to what extent do you agree with that only if China ranked the first in the world, I mean, in all aspects, would it undermine the advocates of Western mod like you know, democracy and capitalism? Thank you very much. China and Chinese are, on the whole, very open-minded, you know. Even we are being the number one, which is already the case in many areas, perhaps more in the future, but we'll adopt a very inclusive mentality. We say win-win, and we show decent respect for other major powers and for small powers. Mm -hmm. So don't worry about this. We'll not become you know, over uh, whatever uh, confident and become arrogant uh, no, no, this is not in the Chinese blood. I think with the, even when China becomes really the number one in more and more areas, which is the case, growing case as now, I think we can handle this in a sophisticated way. The Chinese culture is very sophisticated. We can handle it well. Okay. Uh, please. Uh, please. 在这种情况下,印度是应该或者已经做出了什么行为来应对这个中美贸易战呢? I, I think it's very, very dangerous uh, to have trade wars. And we, we should be worried. But at the same time, it's also becoming very clear that this trade war is teaching the world a lesson and making us aware of how interdependent the world has become. So, for example, when you buy, let's say, an Apple phone, right? The products come from so many different countries, right? And they're constantly crossing borders. And I think as a result of these trade wars, when companies begin to suffer, automobile companies, telephone companies, 
aeroplane companies say, hey, my supplies come from many countries. Then I hope that after the result of these trade wars is that the pendulum will swing back again to countries saying, hey, this is very dangerous and we have to stop it. And my view about President Donald Trump is that he wants to have what you call a short-term perception of a victory. But he doesn't want to have a long-duration trade war because this is the disadvantage President Donald Trump has, is that he faces critical elections in November. This is June, five months from now. And if the trade war causes the economy to slow down, causes people to lose jobs, his party, the Republican Party, may lose in the November elections. So I think that will hold him back a bit. And at the same time, I think the, the rest of the world is putting a lot of pressure on him to say, hey, stop it. And I hope if more people, like more young people like you speak out, maybe you should write an email to President Donald Trump, he might change his mind. <laughs> Thank you very much. Next <laughs> Thank a very direct question. Um, Zhang Weiwei is already laughing. Thank um, you. To uh, Kishore. Is this a question for me? Yes, that's a question oh, okay. for you. I think people seem to forget you are yeah. actually from Singapore. So. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm, ha I'm happy to uh, answer questions on India. And you're, and you're, you're right. I mean, uh, inequality is a challenge globally. And by the way, I think uh, the, the one piece of good news I have for all of you is that, of course, inequality is in principle a bad thing. But the, the laws of economics tell us that in the first phase of development, when countries grow very fast, one natural consequence of that is that countries become more unequal. And China, for example, is Gini coefficient went from 0 0.3, which is very equal to 0 0.47, matching America's inequality. But that's a success story. It's a success story because it comes from development. And so if India's inequality rises because of development, it is a good thing. And if you have time, read a wonderful chapter on uh, inequality written by Steven Pinker of Harvard. And he quotes from a philosopher that I studied, John Rawls. And what John Rawls said is that the most important thing you need to address when it comes to the issue of inequality is what happens to the bottom 10%? Are the bottom 10% better off in a more equal society? Uh, are the bottom 10% of people better off in a more unequal society? And quite often, because inequality is a result of development, the bottom 10% are actually better off in, in a more une unequal society. And in the case of India, for example, India's poverty reduction hasn't been as successful as China's but it's also been quite phenomenal, the number of people that have been lifted up from absolute poverty. So when I gave you the statistic that three quarters of the world population that used to be in world poverty, from 75%, it came down to 10%. It came down to 10% because of China and India having the two largest, most populous societies. So that inequality is not holding back uh, India's development. No, but I suppose, sorry, but I suppose one of the question, um, the point of the question is that, do you see uh, uh, discrimination based on caste and gender being something fundamental, sort of like oh. a fundamental flaw in the social construct of India? Yeah. Well, I, India used to have a very strict caste system. Mm -hmm. That caste system is breaking down okay. as a result of development. Yes, there is gender, gender inequality in India. 
But I can tell you, keep this a secret, okay? Uh, you know, there's a book written by Nobel Prize winner Amartya Sen. It's called The Argumentative Indian. That's the name of the book. Now, I may write a book, make another book called The Argumentative Indian Woman. <laughs> Indian women are among the most outspoken women you will find in the world. And if you go to India, for example, you'll be actually be amazed by the strength of the feminist movement, the strength of the feminist voices, and the pushing for change that is coming in India. So in the past, it is true that the Indian women were, you know, sort of uh, trying to be uh, very demure, uh, withdrawn, and so on and so forth. Now you find a very, very different kind of uh, women. So all these things are changing daily uh, in India. And I'm actually uh, confident eh, that the social revolutions taking place in India as we speak today are profound and fundamental and changing Indian society dramatically. Thank you so much. And ladies and gentlemen, another round of applause for Kishore Mababani and Zhang Weiwei. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.